Hello, everyone. My name is Ole Kagan, and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for LA County Library, and I welcome you to Work Ready Communication Skills in a Virtual Workspace. And now I'd like to tell you about the Work Ready program. Work Ready started in December of 2020 with the purpose of helping people get a job, improve their current work situation, and plan a more sustainable career path. And we're doing that in two ways. We lend out laptops and Wi-Fi hotspots out of 20, soon to be 27 library locations, breaking down the barrier to applying for a job and getting online training. And number two, we provide virtual events just like this one on a range of work related topics from the basics like resumes, cover letters, interviews to deep dives into various careers and other subjects like virtual communication to help you succeed at work. And you can view over 50 of those past classes at any time by checking out the work and career playlist on our YouTube channel, which I'm going to post a link to that right away in the chat. So you can, if you want to browse those as I'm doing the introduction, you are absolutely welcome to do that. And now I'd like to tell you about the Work Ready program we have coming up next week. And that is also Tuesday at 11 o'clock, which is our Work Ready time. Uh, it's going to be a screening of the miniseries Driven, which is all about female entrepreneurs. And next Tuesday, March 28th at 11 o'clock, we're going to be talking to and seeing the episodes of fashionpreneur Brianne Cook and real estate agent Sunny Jones. We're going to be celebrating their accomplishments and discussing their journey. So if you're interested in, in doing that, getting some inspiration, some advice from successful entrepreneurs, next Tuesday at 11 o'clock is the time. And I'm posting a link to that description and the registration for that program in the chat right now. You can click on that register. It's absolutely free, just like all of our library programs. And if you're interested in learning more about library programs, we, you can go to our website at lacountylibrary.org on the top right hand side. If you hover over the events box, you'll get virtual programming. Click on that and you can see all of our virtual events for kids, teens, adults, and register for any of those. Those are, of course, free. And if you want to see all of the in person and virtual events that we have coming up, you can do that too. If you click on that events, link, then you'll get a list of events from all of our 85 library locations. Well, we've got a lot for you, but we've also got a lot for you today. And to introduce our speaker, I have Liz Moeller. Liz is a career coach and a work ready stalwart. Liz has been presenting at libraries in person and virtually for quite a long time. And I'm very happy to have her here to introduce <laughs> our speaker. Liz, the stage is yours. Thank you, Oleg. Wonderful to be back on screen in your home or office or car or wherever you are today. We're back for another fantastic Work Ready program. And I'm super excited to introduce my friend Allison, who I have known for a really long time. Um, she's originally from Chicago, Illinois. I'm originally from Madison, Wisconsin. We met on an adventure and we have been good friends and now coaching associates for a long time. Allison started her career as an electrical engineer. And as you know, engineers are not known for their communication skills, but she quickly migrated into sales and had to learn the communication game. She spent 30 years in the tech industry, including seven startups, resulting in six of them getting bought or going public, taking them to the road. She's mastered the art of getting new technologies adopted, and she's also mastered the art of communication, in important ways to feel valued and heard. Today, she wears multiple hats. She's an analyst for a venture capital firm. She does startup strategy consulting, and she's also an executive coach. She's the director of co executive director at Co-Founders Lab, which is one of the largest startup communities in the world. In all of her roles, she mentors her clients in the art of communication and being more successful. So I'm super glad to have Allison as our guest for today 
and I'm going to let her kick it off on executive communications. Welcome, Allison. Well, thank you, Liz. I'm really excited to be here. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to get started. Um, so I want this to be as interactive as possible. So if you have questions, please feel free to pop them in there into the Q&A and we'll try to get to them as many as we can throughout the call. Here's the thing about communication and why it's so important. Let's say you're going for a job interview and you are highly qualified. You are a 10 out of 10. If your communication is a three, then you are a three out of 10. Communi you, you rise to the level or lower, fall to the level of the quality of your communication. It really is the way you interact with the outside world. So it's important to be intentional. It's one of my favorite words, intentional about your communication skills so that you can present your best self, whether you're looking for a job or you are looking to up-level in your work and make an impact in, in a job you already have. Communication has always been important, but now because we've become the normal is becoming maybe more virtual or distributed workforces, it adds a whole nother layer uh, of challenges, including interviewing remotely, not being able to shake that person's hand. So we're gonna go through some things today uh, to help you uh, up-level your, your communication skills. So first we're gonna talk about the goals of the call. Can give you a little more information about me? We're gonna talk about the communication challenges that are out there and the, right, normally and in a virtual workplace. And I'm gonna introduce you to the four steps to confident communication. And, and how they apply in the virtual world. You're, we're gonna think about an action plan so that you come away with something and what's next. What are you gonna do with this? And then we'll have a Q and A. So here's the thing about these talks. Typically people can only remember about, take away about 15% of what they learned by the next day. Now I think Oleg's gonna send you the slide so you don't need to be writing every word you see on the slide down but definitely takeaways, write down actionable things you can do. So my, my goal for you is to come away with a, a few good nuggets that will uh, get you some immediate impact. Uh, maybe think of one area to specifically focus on that you will get the biggest gain. And we all have tool bags that we carry with us when we do our work. So I'm hoping to make your tool bag a little bit bigger uh, when you're out in the world communicating. So as Liz mentioned, I've been in the tech industry for a long time, and I've been a consultant, an advisor, all the stuff you can read. One of the things is that I've gotten really good at communication and formulating ideas so people can really understand them. I've won every pitch competition I've been in, and selling in a startup is basically going to people that don't know who you are, never heard of your company, and convincing them not only to spend time with you, but to spend money on an unproven technology. So I really had up my communication game. And now I spend a lot of time working with my clients, helping them up level because there is nothing more frustrating than having brilliance inside of you and no one be able to, to see it or understand it. So let's talk about the common communication challenges. Well, first it's self-doubt. When you're not confident and you're not sure of yourself and you're not sure that what you have to say is important or you'll get it out right, you start doubting yourself and then you become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So self-doubt is surprisingly one of the top communication challenges. The second is not knowing your audience. You would probably communicate differently if you're, you know, if you're 20 and you're talking to one of your buddies than you would to your grandma. So if you don't understand the audience you're, you're speaking to and how they communicate, the best channel for them to communicate, language to use with them, style and tone, um, you can have a big disconnect in getting your, uh, getting your ideas across. The other is lack of preparation or awareness. You know, you don't wing it. I didn't just show up here today. Um, I sat down, you know, again this morning before I went through each slide, I made sure I knew what I wanted to say. Um, I know the environment. So I know that because you're on Zoom, I'm gonna have to do some things differently. So preparation is important. And we'll talk more about the cost of, of preparation and how to be more prepared. The other thing is about being too verbose. And this is even more important than ever. People have so many different ways they're being communicated with now. They're getting phone calls, they're getting texts, they're getting emails, they're in Slack channels. There's so much coming at people. The best way to cut through all of that noise is to be concise. So when you're too verbose, it gets lost. 
be known as the person that when they speak, people listen because you are you are crisp and you are clear. Uh, the other thing is to not command attention. If I was sitting here talking and I'm looking down and um, you know talking like this, I'm not commanding your attention. You know, I'm sitting up, I'm leaning in, I'm using my volume, I'm using my tone, I'm pacing, I'm pausing to pull you in. So you need to command attention so that people want to pay attention to you, or they really have no choice but to pay attention to you. The other thing is expecting the audience to read your mind. And what I mean by that is you live with an idea in your head so much that when you go to put it out there, um, you think people get it. But it's sometimes you don't realize you're starting in like the middle of a paragraph and you forgot to give them the introduction. So make sure you give them a grounding of what is the topic, why it's important, and don't leave it for them. The, one of the big mistakes is you assume they need to do with this information. I call it, you didn't complete the sentence. You want to make it easy for people to say yes to you, to your idea, to hiring you, to interviewing you. So don't leave it up to them to fill in the gaps. And the other thing that's one of communication challenges, sometimes people are scared to communicate because they're scared of being wrong. Or what if I say the wrong thing? Or what if I say the right thing? Now I'm now they're gonna expect this of me all the time. So those fears can get in the way, you know, similar to those self-doubts of us really showing up and communicating at our best. Now the virtual world adds this whole nother layer of challenges that we have to deal with. One is trust is more difficult to build. You know, when you meet someone in person, you kind of get the vibe, you shake hands, you walk down the hall to the meeting, you're chatting, you're, you're BSing, and you can build that trust more, more quickly. When you can't see somebody and they're this two-dimensional image, it's more difficult to, to trust them. The other thing that is more difficult is building those connections. Like we mentioned, you know, that, that walk down the hallway, the handshake, the grabbing some, taking them to get some water, you start building a connection. And so in the virtual world, we have to find ways to create that when we're now a two-dimensional. The other thing is people get easily distracted. Cell phones going off, other activities around the house differently than you, when you have somebody captive in a room, right? So there's easily distracted. There's tech challenges. You might have a tool that uh, decides to do a software update just as you're getting on the call or all of a sudden your microphone's not working. So this adds this whole other layer that breaks the flow of our meetings. And then there's environmental challenges. Uh, it could be storming outside, you could lose power, it could be dogs barking, all these other things. Um, another challenge is it's difficult to read body language. Yesterday, I was talking to a client who was learning to read the room better when she's doing these in-person meetings. Well, it's a lot more difficult to do that when you're on a Zoom call. So you've got to be looking at, you know, who's looking at the screen, who might be looking away, who's distracted, who might have yawned. So you really have to be a lot more uh, you know, uh, on point and paying attention. And the other thing to remember is a lot of people are really tired of doing Zooms. They are fatigued. So you have to find ways to be, make, it, make it interesting and to hold them from being engaged with you because people are just kind of, uh, some of them burnt out on this. So these are some of the challenges. Now, why, what is the cost of these challenges and why it, it matters. Well, if you're looking for a job and you're not communicating effectively, you might not get the job or the second interview or progress in the process. Again, you could be a, a 10 out of 10 qualifications, a three out of 10 communicator. Your default is to three out of 10. And just an interesting for those who are in jobs already, an average company loses $12,000 per year per employee as a result of poor communication. How does that show up? Well, projects are going to take longer if you have to go back and explain it multiple times. Or if it's explained wrong and something is done incorrectly, then there's time lost to have to redo it. Or you're not communicating to your clients the proper messaging because internal communication. So $12,000 per employee per year is a cost of, uh, of, of poor communication. The other thing that happens is your ideas aren't listened to. If you, you, know, you, can, you could have worked all night, you have this great idea, uh, and if, if you can't communicate it properly, it's not going to be listened to. And one of the main reasons employees leave is they don't feel heard. And if they don't feel heard, then they don't feel valued and they leave. The other thing that happens with ineffective communication is like tension or lack, of, and it creates a lack of collaboration. So all of a sudden the, 
the team effort starts uh, disintegrating. Think about um, when you're texting somebody and if they took the tone the wrong way because they're not hearing your voice, they would be like, what did she mean? Or what did he mean by that? And all of a sudden their ability to, uh, to listen to you and to be interactive with you has, has decreased. So there is a cost, a serious cost in effective communication. But what do we do about it? How do we up-level our game? Well, first, in order to be successful, you can't wing it. There needs to be a framework. There needs to be some structure so that you know how to prepare. So that every time you're in a communication, whether it's an interview, a meeting, uh, presenting an idea, that you're using the same framework so that you can be at the top of your game. So I'm gonna introduce you to what I consider the four stages for confident and effective communication. So the first is your mindset. And you, you know this wasn't easy for a lot of people. I don't need to think about my mindset's fine, I'm good. Well, actually there are some things to think about. And I'll give you a real world example of what just happened for me and what I had to do uh, to fix my mindset before this call. We're gonna talk about preparation so that when you, when, the, when, you, when you go live, you're ready. We're gonna talk about execution. And another stage that a lot of people overlook is growth. Remember, you're gonna have more than one conversation in your life. Every time you have an interaction, it's an opportunity for growth, but you need to put some framework behind that so that you can actually get that knowledge for the growth. So let's talk about the first one, the mindset. And the first piece of that mindset is the belief that what you have to say is important and deserves to be heard. And that's really powerful. You are in that room for a reason. And that goes to uh, the first tips for creating a mindset for success. When I first did my communication workshop, this first tip was the biggest aha moment for people. That if you are invited to interview, they are already interested in you. So they want you to be there. So that dialogue of, I don't know if I deserve to be here. I don't know if I'm good enough. Well, based on what they know of you, they've already said you are. Or if somebody invites you to attend a meeting, it's because they believe that you will be a valued contributor to that meeting. So don't forget, if you're there, somebody wants you there and they're interested in what you have to say. Second, it's to start naming what's going on in your brain. Are you nervous? Are you scared? Are you doubting yourself? When you say that out loud, oh, okay, I'm just, I'm just a little nervous right now. I haven't interviewed for a while. That, that probably means I really want this and that's okay. That's a good thing. Right? When you name it and you talk it down, it takes the pressure off. It's like going from sitting with your shoulders up here to be like, okay, I am just a little nervous and that's okay. That's a normal human emotion. Time, there are times you can't talk yourself out of it. So you need to get a champion, someone to give you a pep talk. I will tell you that Liz is one of my champions. I will call her whenever I need uh, to get grounded, a pep talk to go forward. You know, I'm lucky that you know, she really believes in me and a great resource as I am for her, right? So having champions and people uh, letting somebody know ahead of time, hey, I'm gonna have an interview uh, or a meeting next week. I'm, getting, I'm gonna get a little nervous. Can we talk beforehand to help me? The other thing, and this is something I just had to use is to have a grounding tool. Now a grounding tool could be breath work. It could be five minute meditation. There's like an app called Insight Timer where you can put the topic you wanna meditate on and the length of it and we'll give you that. It could be a mantra. You know, you might be someone that says, okay, I'm ready to kick butt today. Or you might have a song. I have an old school song I put on when I need my energy to come up. And how this shows up is, you know, just before while Oleg was doing the uh, introduction and I was turning my phone off, I got an email that just ticked me off. <laughs> it was somebody asking me to do something that was their responsibility that was supposed to be done two weeks ago. So it annoyed me. Well, I didn't want to show up annoyed for you guys. So I actually took the time to do four deep breaths. I take a deep breath in, I hold it for four seconds, I blow it out for four, I hold it for four, it's called box breathing. And it just lowered my stress and frustration and got me re-present to be here with, with you all. So it's good to figure out how to have a grounding tool. The breathing is something you can do while somebody else is talking. I can't put on a song while I'm waiting to go live with you guys but I can do some breath work, which will allow me to uh, slow down that angry pulsing energy. The other thing is giving yourself permission to not be perfect. Just know you're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna forget to say something. You're going to 
go blah, 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 something the point, you know, laugh at yourself, but you're not going to be perfect. And you're not going to remember every detail you want to say. I do not read off a script for you guys here because otherwise I will be like this and it will be monotone. So I accept the fact that at the end of this, there might be a point or two that I forgot. I'm giving you guys so much value that I don't worry if one or two points didn't happen. So when you give yourself permission to not be perfect, you are a lot more relaxed. And the other thing is just commit to doing your best and just say, I'm going to show up and do my best. And then whatever happens, that's okay, because I showed up and I did my best. So these are what the tips I suggest for you to create the mindset for success. The next stage is preparation, the stage two. And by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. So there's a lot of things we're going to go through on preparing for a virtual workplace. But first, I'd love to open up the chat or the questions to see what do you think you need to do to be prepared in a virtual world. Any thoughts on that so far? It's a great time to just pause and go, where do I slip up? Where do I really get challenged in my communication? So we, we don't have any questions yet, but if you came to this workshop thinking, gosh, wouldn't it be great if I could get help with dot, 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 technical issues there somebody's already chimed in smiling right so you you know does that mean uh margaret that you should be smiling or shouldn't be smiling but uh you do want to show emotion and in a virtual workplace right um you don't want to be a robot um okay well since there's not like well, the only other question that came in allison i think you're going to get to which is sort of the technical issues and some setup so maybe we'll let you go forward and then we'll circle back and answer some questions about technical issues. Great, yeah, okay, I see Michelle's question on that. We are definitely gonna talk about that. So what do you need to think you need to do? Let's, let's, let's move on. Let's talk about the basics. Okay, so I didn't wanna bore you with just words, so I'm gonna give you some pictures here. Um, okay, yeah, uh, first off, noise. In a virtual world, you have to prepare ahead of time. You, if, if you live on a noisy street, you need to close the windows. If you have other people in the house, you need to close the door to the room you're in. If there's not a room where you can close the door, you need to let everybody know that from 11 to 12 o'clock today, I'm on an important call and I need you to be quiet. I need you to be out of the house. Uh, I need the TV can't be on. So you need to create an environment that is as noise free as possible. The second thing is you need to uh, make sure you're well lit. As you can see, um, I think I'm on the screen. You can see that I am lit. I'm gonna, I have a light on me. I turn it off. Look how that changes. So I have a light. And then right now I have light on one side of me. If I turn, I'm now backlit and you can't see very well. Um, and if I turn this way, the problem is I now have a mirror behind me. And so it's important to make sure that you're lit properly because you want the people to see you. You want them to uh, see this nice, polished, shiny face there. Um, the other thing we want to talk about is your background. <laughs> you're in a virtual workplace and uh, it can be messy. When I am at my partner's house in his office, I can't use a regular background. I have to put a virtual background in there because it's usually messy <laughs> in the office on the couch behind me. And that's not the impression that I want to give to people. So if you're using something like Zoom, there's the ability to add a virtual background. If you are a company, uh, like you know, if you any of you are doing a, your own startup, you should have a background with your company name here on, on, on the screen as well. So make sure that your space is not is messy. Now, the other thing that's important to me is I make sure my desk is clean when I get on calls. I tend to have notes everywhere, but clutter, even if it's not visible to the person on the other end of the, of the camera, clutter drives me crazy and stresses me out. So I create a, a, a clutter-free environment in order to create the best possible image on the camera and behind the camera. The last thing is something to really think about. If you have roommates, uh, whether they're your family, friends, kids, and they're on the computer, and if you're doing a Zoom, 
they might be using all the bandwidth. So do you know how many streams you can effectively have going live at one time? Do you need to tell them, hey, you can't be gaming from 10 to 11, or you can't be streaming uh, your videos at this time because I have a call. So you need to make sure your environment is set up for success. So you wanna reduce the noise, you wanna be well lit, you wanna have a clean, respectable background, and you wanna make sure that the technology is going to be available for you to stream uh, and not be jittery while you are trying to uh, while you are trying to communicate. The other thing is to really get in control of your environment. I'm going to pause for a second. Um, how do you gauge your pace when you're talking or presenting? I usually speak very fast. Okay, so here's the thing: I talk very fast. I just, I'm a street kid, Chicago kid, we talk fast. I have to think about slowing down. So I think about pausing after, you know, every few, few things, it does pull them in. So you wanna slow down and just, you have to do it. You can't make it other, other people. How do you gauge your pace when you're talking and presenting? Well, you practice and you have somebody listen to it and say, this is, uh, I've had some challenges here. So find people to practice with in order to do that. So if you're when you're doing it, if you're not someone who lives on Zoom all the time, or or what are the other ones that people use, um, Teams, or Google Meet, you need to log onto the system first, and make sure and and that you you know how to do it. That it might just be a click, uh, but make sure that you've logged into the system uh, ahead of time. If you've never used any of these technologies before, let's say someone says you're going to be on a Teams call. If you're just giving a guest, that might not be that big of a deal. But if you're going to be um, a host or interacting, then go on YouTube and just watch a video of how to use the technology. Do your headset and mic check. Like I know that I'm in a very quiet environment. I have a relatively new computer, so I don't need to have a headset or a mic right now. If you're doing that, sometimes your software doesn't identify the microphone ahead of time. So you need to make sure that the software switch to the external mic um, when you're doing that. So you want to make sure all of that works before you get on a call. You want to, if you're going to be doing anything interacting, learn the controls of your system. If you, you know, whether it's how to share a screen, for example, on Teams, for some reason, I am not able to share uh, my content on Teams. So I know that I have to send it, send it ahead of time because for some reason, my system doesn't allow me to do that. So I've practiced the controls. And I learned that that was a problem for me. Uh, the other thing is to clear embarrassing tabs off your computer, because if you're going to share your screen and you might have all these tabs open and you might have been doing some shopping, <laughs> uh, shopping for lingerie or, you know, who knows what else. Right. And you don't want people to see those tabs open when you go to share your screen. So make sure that your screen is clear if for some reason you have the possibility of sharing it. Um, so now let's talk about how to be prepared. If you're for every call, you need to think about what is the goal. If this call is successful, what do I want to have happen? If you're interviewing, that could be I want to get to the next stage or I want to get to an offer. If you are presenting an idea, I want people to take specific action. I'm looking for this result. So what is the goal of that meeting? Always, no matter what type of meeting it is, it needs to have a goal. Know your audience. I'll give you an example. So I'm the executive director of the Startup Accelerator for Co-Founders Lab. That's a big mouthful. I was interviewing candidates. I have a master's of science in electrical engineering and parallel processing and fault tolerance. A gentleman I was interviewing was talking to me about his technology and he said, oh, I don't think you would understand which told me a few things. Uh, one is he doesn't know his audience and he did not go on LinkedIn and look me up ahead of time. First off, you just don't say that to somebody because you don't know their knowledge, but all it would have taken would have been 30 seconds for him to go to LinkedIn and scroll down and know a little bit about me. So do your homework, no matter if it's, if it's inside your company or outside, who are you presenting to? What do you need to know about them so that you can be prepared to have the best possible interaction? And then pre-build consensus and create champions. So if you're interviewing, 
I always reach out, you know, I interview to be on panels or to, um, as a coach, coaching organizations, I always reach out to the person I'm interviewing with on LinkedIn ahead of time. And I say to them, I send them a message and I said, I'm looking forward to interviewing with you next week. Um, so you're doing that. If you're going to present an idea inside your company, is there somebody or somebody's that you can go to ahead of time to talk about an idea you want to get presented so that when you present it, it's not crickets? That there's actually dialogue on it and say like, hey, I'm going to present this new idea. I'd love to share it with you ahead of time uh, and really would love to get your thoughts in the meeting, right? So you're creating champions and you're creating um, interaction. So pre-build consensus however you can. Uh, grease the wheels as best you can. And think about potential objections ahead of time. I was coaching somebody yesterday who has changed jobs a lot. And so their resume is a little bit of a year here, a year here, a year here. So we, we we're working on how does he answer the question? You know, it looks like you've moved around a lot. How, what does that happen? We thought about any other objections. So think about whether it's an interview or an idea, what are the potential objections people are gonna have? And then how can you address them ahead of time so that by the time they come up, you can, um, you can be, be prepared to answer them. So let's talk about stage three, which is execution. Whoops, sorry, I'm just checking my clock here. Okay, make see how we're doing on time. Uh, and again, don't forget to put some any questions you have in the chat. So stage three is execution. Now complexity is the enemy of execution, which means if we're overthinking and worrying about everything, we're not in action. And execution is about being in action. So every time, no matter what type of environment, these are things that are gonna happen, you should do all the time. First off, the world has changed. Environmental interruptions are okay. What does that mean? Your dog came in and barked. The Amazon Prime guy dropped off a package and rang the bell. These are now normal things that are accepted. When they happen, don't get flustered because if you're already nervous and this happens and you're like, oh my God, the doorbell rang and they're not gonna think I'm professional and you're gonna get flustered. It's now normal for babies, to, for kids to come into a room and, and say hi while people are on the phone call. So if something happens, you know, we're gonna do your best to set yourself up so that you're gonna minimize these, but, don't, but if they happen, they're okay. And being early, I gotta tell you, yesterday, <laughs> yesterday I was gonna be interviewed on a podcast live and I was supposed to be on five minutes ahead of time. Five minutes before I go to log in, and my Chrome browser uh, froze. And I had to reboot my computer and I got on literally one minute before with no preparation time for this interview, which wasn't fair to the host. And it wasn't fair uh, to, to, you know, for me because I wasn't putting my best foot forward. Did my breathing, I did my grounding, so I was grounded, but I should have tried to log on five minutes earlier and made sure that my technology was okay. I don't know if you've ever been gone to get on a Zoom call and then Zoom's trying to update your software, the latest software. So by being early, you can get around these things. If you're on a group call and there's lots of people on it, if you're not speaking, mute. You can see Oleg and Liz are muted right now. So you're not getting uh, ambient noise from whatever backgrounds they're in. The other thing when you mute is when you unmute, uh, the host might say, oh, you just unmuted and they might prompt them to call on you. But if you're not talking in a group situation, definitely mute. Um, the other thing, no matter what, build a connection post-call. If you're interviewing, you need to be sending a thank you message right away. You need to be highlighting uh, the benefits. You know, there's enough calls on what to do for an interview thank you but that you guys had. But build a, if you're in a group situation, you're sending out an email to everyone, thank them for attending. If it's a couple people and you wanna build a connection with one person, if they're new, make sure if you already haven't sent a LinkedIn connection to them, you've sent a LinkedIn connection. So in this virtual world, it's more important than ever to make an effort to do uh, to do um, um, to, I'm sorry, it, it's it's important to to build connection in the virtual world. That's the thing. People are feeling so disconnected. Anything you can to build connection is important. And the other thing is to be on camera. Um, I teach some programs and I bring in all these specialists and people aren't on camera. 
So these specialists are giving their time free to these people and they don't have the courtesy to be on camera. Now there's often exceptions, I understand that, but the reality is, is that, you know, not having time to do your hair and makeup perfectly isn't is an excuse or because you don't want them to see that you're multitasking is not an excuse. You, you need to show the respect to the people you're, you're there with to be on camera. If you wanna be taken seriously, if you wanna be uh, looked at as somebody that is shows up, you need to be on camera. If you have to find a way to, to go somewhere else where you can be, if you don't have the right environment, figure it out. But the nice thing is there are virtual backgrounds now. So if there's a lot of chaos behind you, people will not see it. Now let's talk about when you're in the call. First is banter. As we talked about, it's a lot of fun when you meet people and you're walking down the hall and you sit there and you're talking and you're saying, what did you do this weekend? Or, oh my God, did you guys catch the game last night? All those things, those can happen on a Zoom call. Even if you're doing one-on-one, -on -one, you know, small talk, it, it just, it makes it a more personal conversation. It breaks the ice. So banter a little bit, you know, if you, if the person you're interviewing with went to like a rival college, hey, you know, I, uh, our guys beat your guys last time or whatever that is. So don't forget that just because you're on a virtual call doesn't mean you don't have to banter. The other thing is the proper position of your head. This guy is perfect. It's about two thirds. You can see where my head is. I have been on, you don't want to be looking at, I've looked at people's noses before. I've looked up people's noses before. You want it to be about two thirds. You want there to be like about a fist between your head and the top of the screen. That's really proper positioning for a call and make sure that again, I, my head could be there, but you don't want the camera above you. I know a lot of people like up oh, cameras high. It makes you look better, but you want to make sure that you have your camera straight on. Um, I have a little stand that raises mine because I'm on a lot of calls. You can have a couple big books if you need to raise it, but you want it to be straight on and a fist, a fist above your head. The other thing is to dress to impress. We've all gotten a little casual out there, right? And just because people can't see you, if you're going to have any type of person that is going to have an input into your future, either, either your ideas or your uh, career trajectory or hiring you, I mean, I have on um, a shirt. I'm, I know blue is a good color for me. Black and white are not the best to be wearing on camera. They kind of hollow you out. So wearing something solid, maybe a little bit of color is good. Don't show up in a t-shirt. Don't, um, don't dress like you're going to the gym. You know, you want people to know that you're taking the time with them seriously. Um, and sometimes I even suggest, you know, you might have your pajama bottoms on or shorts on, but if you're in an interview, dress the entire way down to the shoes because you'll also take yourself more seriously. So make sure that you are dressed properly on the calls. And the last one is not to have food. It's okay to have some water or have a drink uh, nearby because you're talking and you need to do that. Food looks messy, it can get on the screen, you don't wanna be chewing. So uh, if you need to grab a bite before a call, do it to get your blood sugar where it needs to be, but do not have, uh, do not be eating during calls. Uh, so we have a question, is it okay to ask someone to turn on their camera if they join the meeting without the camera on? So you can, it depends on your rules, right? If you're hosting, if you're running the call uh, and you want everybody on camera, you send out a, in your notice, you know, expecting everyone to be on camera tomorrow. Uh, I teach, a, I facilitate for a school where I can't, I ask them, I invite them. I said, if if possible, I'd like to invite you to be on camera so we can see your face. Uh, so it depends on the situation. What you don't wanna do is you, somebody might be dealing with something and you don't wanna make them uncomfortable. So you always say, hey, hey, Peggy, uh, if it's possible to be a camera, we'd love to have you. Cause I had one client who didn't even know they weren't off camera. Um, and then someone was asking about when you're referencing a thank you, you're talking about email, snail mail, or both. Email is the acceptable way for it. Uh, posting on their social media, no. <laughs> That's not a real thank you. I mean, if it's that, it really is writing an email unless it's that culture of that person. But um, it's, uh, it's definitely um, an email is the proper way. Okay, so let's talk about interview execution. 
And I'm going to close the chat for a while here. And so Liz will let me know if there's some more questions coming up. We'll hit a pause again soon for that. So when active listening, if you guys have all heard of active listening, that's when you, you're you leaning in. You might go, uh-huh, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah. Whatever that is to show that you're actually connected with that person. That's also eye contact. And that's difficult when you're on camera, but you need to be making eye contact with the screen. You need to be looking at that camera so people feel like you're looking at them. So active listening is really important. Turn off all distractions. Okay, okay, we know things happen, but if you get notifications beeping on your computer, they need to be turned off. If you're, you have, your phone is in the room, the ringer needs to be turned off. So make sure you have all distractions turned off so you can be present. Now, don't be stiff. You know, when you are talking, I know some people you get nervous and being on Zoom, it just, it's, it can be really uncomfortable. I get it, but you can't be stiff. People are, you have to show that you are a three-dimensional person in this two-dimensional world. So definitely make sure you have some animation, you have some energy. Um, don't be monotone, you know, be, definitely be more of that. Uh, and then creating space to think. So this is one of my things. When somebody asks you a question and you need a minute to think about it, and I know Liz is, you know, the master of teaching people all of this stuff, but I'll say that was a really great question. You know, before I answer that, I'd love to ask you this. And so while they're doing that, it gives you, <laughs> gives you a second to, uh, to think about your answer. So, you know, relax, slow down, and you can create space to think uh, even in a virtual workplace. The other thing is to not interrupt. Now, when you're nervous, and I'm an interrupter, I grew up in the house that the only way you get to be heard is to interrupt. So it's unfortunately my default and I have to be very mindful of that. The other thing is I have a, my engineer's brain is already like processed the answer and onto the next thing. So I already know what they're gonna finish saying. And I will like jump in and just take, you know, continue. You cannot do that. You have to let people have the gift of being listened to and finishing. If you're like me and an idea, you're worried about an idea getting out of your brain, have a pad of paper and a piece of, uh, and a pen next to you so that you can write down that idea, but don't interrupt. The other problem is when you interrupt on uh, a Zoom sub calls, you kind of cancel each other's voices out and now people won't hear anything. So these are the things to do to prepare and execute uh, more effectively in an interview. If you're attending a meeting, we already talked about being concise. Be the person that says the least and says the most at the same time. The less amount of words you can do use to say something, the more it's actually gonna be understood and heard. It seems counterintuitive, but again, so much noise coming at people. You wanna grab them in the first few seconds, like why is what you're saying important to them? Uh, and then you can ask if they'd like more details but be concise, cut through the noise, be the one that listens to, you know, speak up. We talked about that before. You gotta speak up. You gotta let people hear you. You gotta make sure that you engage, right? Um, the other thing is varying your tone and your speed because otherwise you will be a monotone Mary and you will not be listened to. And after a minute, they'll be like on their phone and doing other things. So you need to vary your tone, vary your speed. The other thing is about managing your energy. Now, I had this really interesting, I have a client who goes from meeting to meeting to meeting. And then when she gets into that meeting, she is a bulldozer. <laughs> she just goes in there a million miles an hour and it's, just, it's really disruptive to her team. So you have to manage your energy. You know, that's important to make sure that you have time beforehand to slow down, to do that grounding energy. If you're a lower energy person, um, you want to manage it. When I'm meeting with people from you know, New York, I tend to talk faster and a little louder and, and you know, a little more playful like with them. If I'm meeting someone that might be foreign and English isn't their primary language, I slow my energy down. I talk slower to make sure that they have the opportunity to hear me and I'm showing them respect for that environment, knowing that it's not their primary language. One of the other things you want to do when you're in a meeting is to try to limit saying or or but. Can you imagine you have this idea you're all excited about and, some, and then somebody goes, yeah, but. One of the better ways to build a reputation for being a positive, collaborative person is like, you know, I like that idea and I think we can get even more out of it if we do this. 
instead of saying, but I think we're not going to get enough out of it. So what you want to be known for is somebody that encourages and builds upon other people's ideas versus negating it. And if you're in a meeting with a team and if your boss is there or customers are there or people that are going to have a direct influence on the path of your career, participate somehow. Let your presence be known. Do not be a mouse in the room, in the corner, off camera, not saying anything, head down, because what that's saying is that you're not, you're not engaged, you're not listening. And you might be, you might be taking copious notes, you might be on every word, you are ready to jump into action. But if you're not participating, there is no way for anybody to know that you are present and engaged. So find some way, whether it's asking a question, whether it's banter at the beginning, make your presence known. Now, if you're hosting a call, you get to decide the rules of communication. What do I mean by that? For example, I host, I facilitate this, uh, these breakout sessions for my, one of my schools. And I know that introverts uh, might not have the natural ability to like interject into the conversation with the flow. It's harder for them when there's multiple dialogues going. So my rules of communication are, you can, if you're a natural at jumping into the conversation, great. If not, raise your hand. And in the order that the hands are raised, I'll make sure that everybody's heard. So that's one of the things that I do to make sure that my quieter people in the meeting have the opportunity to communicate and not be stressed out trying to figure out how they're going to interject. The other thing is the goals for the meeting. You always want to have a framework of the meeting, what the goal is, what are people going to get out of it, uh, what would be a win for them and for you. Uh, the other thing is at the end of a meeting, we talked about how companies lose 12K a year per person for lack of communication, good communication. This is a huge one. At the end of a meeting, and it's also at the end of an interview, anything, right? Who, what action is supposed to be done? Who's the owner of that action? And what time frame are they agreeing to get that action done by? So it could be, you know, um, at the end of this call, Liz, uh, I, you know, or this would be Oleg, um, you know, uh, so he's the owner of the action is I want you to send out the slide deck to everybody that's on the call and I'd like it to be done by Friday. You know, if he agrees to that, we now have a, 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 an agreement of action owner time frame. If you're a host, lead the banter, get the people talking, get them engaged, pull them in. So they're not on their, get up, they'll get them off their phone, you know, get some, get some things going, try to get everybody involved. Yeah, uh, if you're noticing there be some people that might not feel comfortable doing that, you you know don't put them on the spot and say you know, but you can always say, hey, you know, hey Frank, I haven't heard from, we haven't heard from you yet. We'd love to know if you have any ideas on this. Um, we talked about using tools like the hand raise, and then at the end, if you are the host, send out an email to the appropriate players that confirm the action owner timeframe. Because two things happen: one is you don't get clarity on that, and two, it's not written down. And so it gets lost. So if you're hosting a virtual meeting, these are the loop rules that you should set up. Now, this is a big one. We have so many different ways we can communicate. You have email, you have text, you have phone, and you have chat. And it's really difficult sometimes to figure out how to do them differently. So I have a few notes here to make sure I don't forget on this one. So email is great for, you know, like thank yous. It's for when you want to have more details. It's good for non-urgent communication and it needs, it's good for something that needs to be documented, uh, such as sending reports and proposals, memos, follow-ups uh, for all of that. It's also useful for communicating with large groups or people at once. The one tip, if you're committing to a large group, if you want it to be people responding, great. If it's primarily one way, and you don't and you don't mind individuals, but you don't want people to reply to all. There's this thing called BCC. So when I send out a thing to all my friends when we're organizing something, I put all 20 names in the BCC so that I only need their individual response so they're going to make it. And so it doesn't flood 20 people with 20 extra emails. So email is great for uh, when you need a, a documented track record, detailed information, and uh, you're going to send it to multiple people. Phone, phone, what's really good about phone, and I know the younger generation are more texting, Phone gives you tone, it gives you context, it gives you connection. So if there's a one-to-one -one conversation, you know, that it's important to do it on the phone. If it's urgent uh, and it's gonna require some back and forth more than a text, 
you definitely want to do that because it's building rapport. It's building a personal connection. So don't forget the art of using the phone. Text messaging, you know, you have to make sure that person is okay with you sending text. So they've given you their personal email, uh, phone number and you might ask them if texting is great. For example, we were just on my team call before this. Two people were late. We sent them a quick text. Are you gonna join the call? Texting is not for continuous communication. It is for something quick, confirming appointments, meeting times, change of location, instructions that might not have come through, but it's not meant for continuous conversation. Now, a lot of companies now have chat tools, Slack being the most common. Uh, and it's funny, I was just on a call and there's a little bit of a generational thing where the one guy who's younger, much younger than me, chat is how he wants to primarily you know, communicate. And I want things in a web and a web page, right? So it's different, but chat is great for real-time communication. Um, it's a great way, if this was a Zoom call versus a webinar, you guys could all be in the chat talking to each other. It builds collaboration. It lets people share ideas with each other, um, provide updates, but it can be a lot of noise and you have to serially scroll through things so things can get lost. So it's you gotta be careful when you use chat because if the people that you want to see what you're putting in there don't log in until there's 10 more chats below them, they're not gonna get that information. So it's really important to make sure based on the goal of the information you're sharing, which communication channel you use. So that's some execution tips. I know it's a lot, but hopefully you guys have gotten a couple that you can put into action today. So let's talk about growth. Growth is so important because you want to you want to continue to evolve. You want to get better at communicating. You want to get better at getting your ideas across. You want to get the darn job, right? So one of the things is to ask for feedback if you if it's available to you. Um, how did that go? What could I have done better? Uh, what did you like about it? Um, get get feedback. How was my style? Was I easy to understand? I'm trying to work on this. I was curious if I did that. So ask for feedback. Second is don't dwell on mistakes. You know, this isn't one and done. You're going to have multiple times in your life where you're going to have interviews and communications. I stumbled over myself a couple of times here and had a few moments. Well, I don't think the quality of what you learned today is affected because I made a few uh, mistakes and I might look at my notes later and realize I forgot something, right? Just don't dwell on it. It's like, what can I learn from it? and move on. Celebrate small victories. I had my first interview in 10 years today and it went great. Or I really did, I did a great job answering their question. You know, why, why should we hire you? So if you have those moments, celebrate them, however you want to celebrate, but make sure you acknowledge yourself for doing well. And the last thing, one of the things is debrief with yourself. Now, this is where you get to practice kindness on yourself. When I do a call, whether it's with a client after this, I'll ask myself three questions. What did I like that I did? What could I have done better? And what did I learn from doing this? So none of those are self-deprecating questions, right? It's what do I, what's the positive that I did? What did I learn? And what could I do better? So you should be asking yourself those three questions all the time so you can continue to raise the bar on yourself uh, for the next call. And last, find mentors you want to emulate. When you're on calls, look at the people. Listen to the people that they're really getting listened to. And they're really commanding attention and getting their ideas across. What can you learn from them? I remember when I first went from engineering into a, a field support role, I had three guys in the office. One of them was the best communicator. One of them was a great business strategist. And one was a great technologist. So I decided that I was going to learn from each one of those three those skills to be able to uh, up-level my game. Okay, so that was a lot of information. We'll take a breath here. So let's talk about an action plan. I would love to see before we get to Q&A, are there any big takeaways from this that anybody wants to share with us? And it's okay if you, if you wanna be shy and not share that, but I'm curious if there's any takeaways that you, uh, um, and I look at the questions as we do that. 
I think a couple of takeaways that people got were thank you for when to send an email, when to send a text, when to send that one came up as being very, very helpful. And I want to congratulate Allison on being spot on with her timing because we are right at the top of the hour and we've now, now have about 15 minutes for Q&A. Couple people, uh, you know, we had a couple people, David and Waleed, were like, oh, How do you do your pacing in a presentation? And, and what do you do to slow down your speaking? Yeah, we so we talked about that a little bit earlier, right? It's practice. First, first off, it's good that you know that. And as I mentioned, I'm a fast talker and I deal with a lot of non native English speakers. So I have to make sure I slow down. Um, if you have trouble remembering what you're going to say, and I know for me, it's like sometimes talking fast is because I got to get my idea out before it gets out of my brain. Right? And uh, So you need to make sure that you, you write notes down to do that. Um, engaging your pace. You know, there's some great people on, on YouTube. There's this guy, Vin from Australia that I follow. I'll look up his name while we're asking the questions. And he does. I, he's, he's one of my guys that I watch. I have him on Instagram. And I, he gives me, he does great tips for pacing and things like that. So just getting to your action plan, you know, what stage needs the most focus? What's some immediate action you can do? And be brave, right? Let's do that. So let's do, uh, let's continue the q and I'll, I'll keep scrolling through. Um, yeah, there's a few people that are saying, you know, some of their key takeaways are just where to be in the frame. And, you know, wearing a suit, you know, dress to impress, it builds up your confidence and you never know when you're going to have to get up and go answer the door and you don't want to be caught in your uh, pajama bottoms. So that was good. Um, any other pointers on how to make sure you're being clear and concise when you have to de deliver a lot of detailed information? Practice. You can record yourself on Zoom and uh, listen back to it. You know, it, you can have somebody who has no bearing on the uh, thing to listen to it for you, but it really is practice. And that also asking for feedback, right? You always ask for feedback. What could I have done better? How would this have been better? Um, I, I wanted to uh, go through, someone said, I have a couple of decades of experience in a specific field and I'm looking to completely change careers. How would I preempt that potential objections in that scenario? That's a great question. So that experience is valuable to whatever career you do. So what you need to do is figure out how to share what qualities from that career moving forward and be able to say unapologetically, you know, this is where I was. I'm at this point in my career, I realize that I'm looking for something different that fulfills this parts that this didn't do for me. Uh, but I realized also that the experience that I've had uh, that I can bring forward. So it doesn't mean that the work you've done before is irrelevant. Find that bridge between that and just be very clear. Like, you know, I have evolved. What's important to me, what's what's interesting to me has evolved and I'm ready to make a change. And that's OK. Uh, some people will give you a chance and some people won't. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with that. I did that completely at, uh, when I went out on my own. Right. Uh, what do you do if, the, if you were in an interview and you're asked a question about the company that you don't have an answer to? Well. Um, hopefully, uh, and, uh, your lesson was to do your homework ahead of time, right? Uh, I mean, that's, um, but then you got to dance and dancing looks like saying, you know, I, uh, I, I didn't see that information when I did that. Um, and, uh, if you don't have, you know, but I'll follow up with you on that. So if you don't have the information, follow up and then follow up. Right. But if you, if you get caught not knowing something, then hopefully you learn the next time to, um, to do a little more homework. How to avoid speaking over people, so annoying. Yes, it is annoying. Uh, you know, if you have to sit on your hands, <laughs> you know, whatever you have to do, turn your mute, make sure you're mute. If you have a tendency to, to, to have like Tourette's moments and jump in, um, put your phone on mute, your, so your mic on mute, so you don't do that. Um, can you please go over again, how do you create space for think? Uh, buy yourself time to think for an answer. Yeah, it's by asking a question. Right. So what someone was saying is that if they ask me a question and I need a moment to to get my thoughts together. I'm like, that's a really great question. I'd love to ask you a few more details about that before I answer. And while they're doing that, you're formulating your idea in your head. So ask a question, get them talking so you have time to do that. What are examples of chat? Well, that would be like a Facebook Messenger or Slack or internal company tools where you're just kind of in these scroll modes that normally a large community is on there at the same time. 
yeah, wear a suit for Zoom calls if you, if you want to make the right impression. Um, how can you be clear and concise when delivering detailed information? Well, you got to break it down. You got to think about the, the knowledge that your audience has and what level that they're starting at and make sure that uh, you're bringing them board. Now, there are some stuff that's going to, if you're doing a technical presentation, if that's what's called for, not what you think is called for, but if that's what the meeting requires, then you just make sure you break it into consumable bites. And along the way, ask people if, they're, if they have any questions so that you don't lose them. So it's just about breaking it into bites and it's okay for being detailed, but is it detailed because they need the details or is it detailed because you wanna get the details out? So make sure those details are important to your audience. It's a nice tie-in to a comment that, that Matt put in the chat that says he actually uses sticky notes and he puts the topics on and around his computer so he's actually really prepared. So he might put, you know, if it helps him with his faulty memory. I think we all go through that, but yeah. also it helps him sort of structure it. And if you put it around the computer, your eyes might glance up rather than down. So I thought that was a good comment. Yes, that's a great one. I've done sticky notes when I've had to do some talks and I didn't want to forget a few things as well. Uh, what if your interviewer is doing a lot of these don'ts? Best advice. Well, if you're being interviewed, you, you don't get to comment on them, right? Because uh, unfortunately, but you have to sit there and say, well, if this person's going to be my boss, do they not have good communication skills? Would I not be able to learn from them? Um, so that might be giving you some information on that. But yeah, is, unfortunately, since you are there to get a job, you are not in the position to correct. Um, I do think it's helpful, though, that Oleg is going to record this session and that you may be, be working with somebody or maybe you have an adult child or maybe you, you have a colleague or a friend who could benefit. You could actually like watch the video and even pause it and take notes and then you could forward the link to a friend and say, hey, I was thinking about you at you know, the 25 minute mark. She has some good pointers. So this is not information that we all know. This is kind of life skills. And sometimes you have to learn these things by uh, trial and error, or you learn them by having a mistake happen. And you say, oh, I'll never again will I try to log on with five minutes because you know the power could go out. So I think that sharing this information, you know, Allison and I are really big on pay it forward. Whatever we coach our clients, we want them to teach other people. And this program is, is a great one to kind of pick up on these, these little sound bites. Great. So do we have time for me to answer a couple more questions? We do. We've got another 10 minutes. Okay. So I'm introverted and struggle with banter and participation. Any tips or resources to help with this? I, I you know, listen, I know it's tough when you're an introvert. Um, it's just think about like talking to a friend, like you're catching up with a friend, you know, and just ask a question, you know, oh, did you do, you know, how are you, you know, if your weather is always great, right? Weather is always a great topic of conversation. If you know where the person is, you know, God, it's raining nonstop here. How is it where you're at, right? Um, if you, you know, if, if it's a Monday, you know, how did you have a good weekend? Do anything fun this weekend, right? So when you're an introvert, you can get them talking. But you should just ask, you should have a few basic questions that you can ask uh, to do that. If there was something big and fun in the news this weekend, uh, you know, did you know the new new blockbuster movie broke a record? Did you do that? So uh, something that's a very safe topic, right, to do that. So just ask a question to get people going. Um, how to explain most jobs have been a year? Well, you know, it depends on the situation. For example, uh, my partner, I was asking him, would you hire someone that's changed jobs a lot? He said in the last three years, yes, because of COVID. He said that if they are honest about what's been going on and the challenges uh, of, of figuring it out, that's okay. Um, it's about not, it's about being real. It could, you know, for example, this guy that I was coaching, I knew him, we worked together years ago and I'd be like, you know, I was a young cowboy. I was seeking out the big deals. I was following this guy. And now I'm at a point where I'm in my fifties and I really want to find a home and I'm ready to be more intentional with it. And I've kind of gotten that, you know, sowing my oats thing out of my system. And it's time for me to find a company that I can build a longstanding relationship with. It's just an example of, of a way to, to do that. I think it's really solid about being intentional. And I think that's what Michelle put in the comment is that we all have to rehearse in our minds what we're going to say and make it come out in the most positive light you can. 
because the truth is you got fired. The truth is you quit. But what was going on? Go ahead and, and allow that story to come true because situations happen. And so apologies are always a good way to go and saying, you know, I learned a lesson there. This job just wasn't the right fit. Uh, and I love what you said about reviewing it. And Allison pointed out, you know, what did I like about how I handled that situation? What could I do better? And what have I learned? Because I think that being as prepared as possible, there's no such thing as being perfect. And we have to let ourselves like re realize that. Yes. Uh, so Lisa asked, uh, first, thank you for the compliment. Um, my question is, do you, how do you capture the audience's attention when they are clearly distracted on Zoom? Seeing odd activities can sometimes distract me. So it depends on Lisa, what your role is in the room. If you are the leader of the call, then you can kind of be like, buddy, I know we got a lot going on. I'm going to snap you back. Let's put it down, right? Or you might say, okay, you know what? Looks like we've lost some focus. Um, so let's take a two minute break, you know, go refill your water, go check your email really quick. If you need to run to the restroom, let's get back. Uh, people have gotten people if they feel like the energy is waning, just like in a room. Liz is good at getting energy in a room, you know, getting everyone to stand up, right? And I don't care if we're on Zoom, everybody stand up, let's shake our hands, let's get some energy going. So if you're in a position to do that, you can do that. If you're not and you're speaking, that's when you have to use your voice and your tone and the power of your presence to pull people in. You maybe you have something you throw unexpectedly, unexpectedly to kind of shock people uh, back into attention, right? Um, you know, you can sit there and say, you know, you might even have fun and say, and then the pink elephant went to the the gray zebra and said, right, and they'd be like, huh? Oh, I was just seeing if you guys were paying attention, you know. So having some fun with it is another uh, another way to do that. Liz, have I missed any uh, any of the questions? You've done great. And I was just going to say in, in response to what you were commenting to Lisa, if you're watching a Zoom and you see some activity that's going on that maybe the presenter is not even aware of, that's where you're putting something in the chat, like saying, hey, if you're not on screen, can you, you know, go ahead and go on mute? Or you can actually in the chat on Zoom, you can actually message the presenter individually. And sometimes it doesn't have to go out to everybody on the chat. It can just go to that presenter to say, hey, heads up. I think that, you know, your your microphone is a little weak or something like that. It's It kind of boils down to human nature and we're all human. And I remember when Oleg first reached out and said, hey, I know you've been presenting live in person in the libraries for over 10 years. Are you Are you willing to go on Zoom? And I live in Los Angeles. And initially I was like, no, I am not a TV personality. I'm not a movie star. I'm not ready for this. But then again, we all have to accommodate. And it, we may not like it. We may be introverts. But these kind of sessions where Allison gives us lots of pointers just sort of boil down to, yeah, we have now we now know a lot more than all those people who aren't watching this video. So you guys are all, I mean, congratulations and thank you for participating because you're here to learn and we love having you here. And Oleg is always ready to put, you know, comments in the chat and help us sort of make even more of these programs. So, so I'm going to give you guys two final things though, Liz, before we go. Yeah. So I would make yourself a checklist before you jump on a call of the things you need to do, you know, so you don't forget, did I tell my roommates to not be on this? Uh, did I, uh, you know, get dressed? Do I, did I test my mic? Do I have to, you know, make yourself a little checklist. Uh, for me, you know, breathing is now my grounding tool uh, before a call. I can get grounded in four breaths, but what do you need to do to bring your energy down, to bring your nerves down? So make a preparation list uh, and that will, that will help you. The other thing is, I'm a big believer. I, I talk a lot about with my clients about the, you know, choosing who you want to be, right? We focus on so much on what we do on these calls, but before you get on there, be intentional again about who you want to be. I want to be confident. I want to be clear. I want to be articulate. I want to be seen as an expert, you know, and then the doing is a byproduct of when you decide who you want to be on the call. So be intentional about thinking about how do I want to be perceived on this call? How do I want to show up? That's going to be a big part that's going to help you uh, as a byproduct of that communicate more confidently and clearly. So I want to thank you guys for having me. I'll let Liz and Oleg wrap it up. I have my contact information on the screen there, and I wish you all good luck on your journey. And back to you and Liz and Oleg. 
Thank you again, Allison. This has really been a lot of fun. And um, we both, Allison and I are both on LinkedIn. So send us a little message. Tell us that you saw us here, that you met us on Work Ready. And then since we don't have a lot of time to go into Q&A, if you've got questions, um, email or text us or reach out to us. So thank you. Sure. Thank you, Allison, very much for this presentation and Liz for hosting. Um, very much appreciated. And thank you all to the folks out there. Now, Liz just mentioned that that if you do have questions, you can always respond to the follow up email. I'm going to CC Liz and Allison on that. So you can respond to that. You can message them on LinkedIn as well. And Liz, I'm so glad that you agreed way back when to get on Zoom because uh, it's been it's been lovely having you all of these times and then and then moving forward. So let me go ahead and just do two more things. First, I'm going to let the folks know um, we weren't here right at the beginning what we have coming up next week, and that is the a screening of Driven. Driven is a mini series put together by Judith Norman of Start Her TV that celebrates women entrepreneurs, many of them women entrepreneurs of color. And we're going to have two episodes of local entrepreneurs screening next week. They're about 20 minutes each. And after the episodes, we're going to have an interview with the subjects of those of those episodes. And you're going to be able to ask them questions. I'm going to go ahead and post the information about that in the chat so that you'll be able to register and of course, just like this program, that program is going to be recorded, although the, the episodes are not going to be broadcast on YouTube, the panel will be recorded, so you'll be able to see them answering the questions. So here's the information for that work ready screening of Driven and Q&A again, 11 o'clock next Tuesday, March 28th. And for the last thing, you know, I always send out a post event survey to get feedback from you, because why do we do these programs? We do them for the people. And so the last question on that is, what would you like us to cover in the future? And that, to me, that's probably the most important question, because we want to know what you're interested in, what questions you have, you know. There's programs we've done just based on somebody asked a single question, and we expanded the whole question into a program. So we'll find experts for you. We'll do everything we can to try to answer your questions. So here's the link to the post-event survey. It just takes a moment to fill out, and we appreciate it if you would do that. Once again, Allison, Liz, thank you so much for providing your wonderful information, and we'll see you all next time.